Hello, friends. Welcome back to this little program we like to call New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. The Internet of Cars takes Manhattan. We've got that story, plus a Magna Carta for the web pleases the crown. But first, all the latest midterm election. Ne- <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that was a great distraction, those midterm elections from the U.S. dropping more white phosphorus chemical weapons on Syria, though. So in non-selection news, Tehran keeps going crypto for sanction relief. We grabbed this story from the Asia Times. Since 2013 and perhaps earlier, Iran has been engaging in cryptocurrency-based transactions for a variety of purposes. Back on October 11th, the U.S. Department of Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, issued an advisory that stated, among other things, that, quote, with the full reimposition on November 5th of sanctions lifted under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, FinCEN expects that Iranian financial institutions, the Iranian regime, and its officials will increase their efforts to evade U.S. sanctions to fund malign activities and secure hard currency for the government of Iran, end quote. The U.S. also asserts that the Iranian regime uses deceptive practices, including front companies, fraudulent documents, exchange houses, seemingly legitimate businesses, and government officials to generate illicit revenues and finance their malign activities. Insert the Spider-Man double meme of the, you know, pointing at each other. Financial institutions should also be aware of possible Iranian abuses of virtual currency and precious metals to evade sanctions and gain access to the international financial system and to conceal their nefarious actions. So, James, it pretty much looks like either sort of, I'm not sure if the sanctions are the cart or the horse, but the West is sort of openly going after Iran via cryptocurrency? Well, through the financial system, I think that's the meat and potatoes of this story. So for people who don't know this backstory, uh, they will want to check out a couple of things that I wrote earlier this year, How to Evade Sanctions, where I talked specifically about the coming Iranian sanctions and what Iran would likely do to get around them. I also wrote about the death of SWIFT and the engineered death of the dollar a couple of months ago, which is, I think, pertinent to this conversation. Because again, for people who don't know, the SWIFT network is the uh, financial um, transaction data passing network that banks use to basically exchange information across borders, even within borders, but mostly internationally. And if you're cut off from SWIFT, you're dead. And of course, there was the big question, will SWIFT cave into the US and delist these Iranian banks? Will they not? Well, it turns out they did. So um, the sanctions are basically locking back into place like what we had back in 2012 against Iran. And but this time around, there's this brand new currency, technology, whatever, this thing, Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency, that maybe they can use to get around these sanctions. Well, if you read, really dr- drill down into this story, they go um, down to the uh, the specifics and they say that only a few million dollars per year of transactions uh, of Bitcoin are flowing into or out of Iran. I think they, they give some sort of figure like that. How do they know that figure? But anyway... Um, which kind of puts things in perspective. I mean, they are not selling or buying or selling a million barrels of oil, you know, in Bitcoin right now. This is still very theoretical. This is still very hypothetical, but it is something that could develop in the coming years. And they talk about the possibility of Iran forming their own national crypto, which again is nonsense. It's total against the entire purpose and raison d'etre of cryptocurrency is to have a national <laughs> cryptocurrency that's controlled by the government, um, like Venezuela is trying to do. It's it's a contradiction in terms. It will fail. But anyway, they'll probably try it. Um, and maybe they will then transact in more uh, in established cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And there are others. But anyway, uh, all of this to say that just as a reminder, the financial system is the globalist's choke point. That is how they will kill any of their competition or allow competition that they want to flower to flower. Like, hey, I don't know, China. You think they just magically became one of the largest economies on the world in the world in the past couple of decades? No, they were allowed to come to that position. And Iran is not going to be allowed to uh, similarly flower in their own economic endeavors because of that choke point, the financial choke point. That's the uh, the word of the day. So if you don't know about Operation Choke Point, I will also throw in a link to Choke Point, how the government will control the cashless economy, which I wrote a couple of years ago, which again is highly pertinent to this conversation because it's not just about nations and sanctions against nations. Ultimately, this is about 
you as an individual and what you will be allowed to do or not do as more and more of that financial control accrues in the hands of the banksters and their puppet politicians. This is the game for all the marbles, and this is why the conversation around cryptocurrency, although it is overhyped and over-talked about at this point, is important theoretically for what is coming and what is possible for getting around these types of sanctions. Isn't it interesting? I mean, we've we've talked about this before, and it really is in some ways the, the story of mankind is the money changers versus the people, whether it's the Bible or it's a wonderful life. It always kind of comes back to this story. And we've talked about some of the others, and there are others exploring this avenue. James, plans for digital currency spark political crisis in the Marshall Islands. President Hilda Haynes' plan to adopt sovereign cryptocurrency prompts immediate no-confidence vote. So that's the Marshall Islands. Then we head over to Hong Kong. Hong Kong securities regulator to propose sandbox for crypto exchanges. Just, you know, dipping their toes into it. You can play around. And finally, Thailand wants to use blockchain to what? Catch tax dodgers. James, comment on the uh, tax dodgers? Yeah, and if you drill down into that story... It's another, yet another example of people who don't, or well, playing on people who don't know what blockchain is, what Bitcoin is, what cryptocurrency is, because people read that and think, there you go, you know, these cryptocurrencies are all about catching tax evaders, when if you drill down in that story, no, they're literally going to database uh, tax transactions. That's that's what it is. They're using blockchain as just a database. For people who need to r get the basics so they can start to wrap their minds around these word tricks that are these Jedi word tricks that are being played on the population right now, please do go back and watch or rewatch the Bitcoin PSYOP, where I uh, hi uh, highlight Andreas Antonopoulos talking about the difference between blockchain and BS. And this is very much an example of the BS side of that uh, equation. Almost every day so far this week on my morning show, I've had some story about West Virginia is going to use blockchain for its elections. The CDC is going to use blockchain to try and keep a chain of command on all the monstrosities that have been released. Again, it is it's it's buzzwords. Our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 356, I think, takes us back to the crown where Sir Tim Berners-Lee launches Magna Carta for the web to save the internet from abuse. Sir Tim Berners-Lee has launched a Magna Carta for the web, warning that tech giants must change their ways to save the online world from the dangerous forces they have unleashed. Sir Tim, who invented the World Wide Web in 1989, called for a revolution in how the internet is regulated and monetized in order to stem abuse, political polarization, and, of course, the ever-popular fake news. 63-year-old was speaking at the Web Summit in Lisbon to launch a new contract for the web, which asks, asks Internet companies to uphold a set of principles such as protecting privacy, being transparent about their algorithms. As part of the FANG, Fedbook, and Gulag have backed the contract. They say, don't throw us in the briar patch, which will all be agreed in detail next year, despite both companies, of course, being mentioned by its creator as examples of how the web we know and love is under threat. Sir Tim, who developed the web as a side gig while he was trying to open black holes at the CERN Research Lab in Switzerland in the 80s, has become increasingly vocal about what he sees as a perversion of his original vision. We'll include the link to contractfortheweb.org where it states the web was designed to bring people together and make knowledge freely available. Everyone has a role to play to ensure that blah, blah, bling, bling, bloom. James, a couple weeks ago on actually my Good News Next Week episode, a listener had suggested the story about Internet 2.0, decentralized and in our hands. And he added very smartly a question mark to that. So it's Tim Berners-Lee and MIT, and he's got this whole new browser that's just going to save the web, and it's called Solid. James? Yeah, this is like a game that we can spot. How many alarms does this trigger for aware and awake people in the audience? Sir... Tim Berners-Lee at MIT is getting the fangs and Richard Branson and all of these ghouls on board for this contract for the web. What could go wrong, right, guys? No, no, no. But you're a silly conspiracy theory for thinking something like that. Just a fringe nut that, you know, most right-thinking people will see this and just take it for what it... 
Oh, wait, no. We're, re- we're including the Yahoo.com link to this story specifically because this is another example. You go down to the comments, people are not buying this. Overwhelmingly, people are not buying this. Some of my favorite comments just in the top of the, the comment tra- train here. Uh, if Facebook and Google have signed on to this Magna Carta, then we know it's not going to protect us. Berners-Lee is covering for them. Yep, I agree. Or uh, the problem with the web is people like Berners-Lee who talk about profoundly invasive and pervasive surveillance systems, which is what it has become, in childish platitudes and cartoon network level references to great things, good and bad, that's humanity, and other trivializations. Here's an idea. Google and Facebook should start a YouTube channel where their engineers give daily briefings and in-depth lectures about what exactly they are doing. (laughs) Well, we all know that's not going to happen, right? But it's a good point. Again, this is what it would actually look like if these companies were anything more than giving lip service to true transparency and what is really going on with the web. No, this is not about them handing over their control or, you know, giving everyone a platform or all these other meaningless platitudes. The devil is always in the details. And newsflash, if Facebook and Google and all these government creatures and whoever it is, uh, Gordon Brown, I think, was on board of this contract for the web. Come on. Come on. They are not there to be your friends. They are there to uh, lull you to sleep. And, oh, don't worry, they're taking care of it. So I am not holding my breath waiting for Sir Tim Berners-Lee to uh, to hand the decentralized web to us from on high. Ain't gonna happen. So uh, for people who are interested in decentralized web and what is really on the horizon, I'll throw a link into an interesting YouTube video talking about some of the de-web decentralized web technologies that are coming online that are going to truly revolutionize our idea of what the internet is or could be. And there are a lot of them out there. You just haven't heard about them because they're not being promoted by MIT knighted shills. (laughs) And we don't really have to wait for them to do live streams to talk about what they're doing because at least some outlets like Veritas have busted out those hidden camera videos showing them all talking about how they rig every single thing on there. I do like how on the, and this is sometimes again, how the weapons get used against them on the Yahoo page. They, they kind of bump up the, the comments. So you see them. So they just kind of pop right up. So it says, yeah, this is BS. Yeah, I don't buy this. It's a nice extra part. And of course, Richard Branson, don't forget, he is part of the, uh, what they call themselves, the Illuminati superheroes. Because <laughs> it's all a big joke, right? Our third and final story on this New World Next Week episode takes us to the big rotten apple New York City cars to talk to one another under traffic safety pilot program. This from the Wall Street Journal. Your New York City bus or taxi may soon be able to sense the movement of vehicles and the timing of traffic lights within a several block radius as part of a trial program to reduce road injuries and deaths. As part of a $25 million pilot program, 8,000 vehicles in New York will be outfitted with special devices that can communicate with one another as well as with roadside sensors, traffic signals, and app-enabled smartphones. So, James, that's all I could get from that link from the Wall Street Journal because, of course, the paywall comes up and the text starts to kind of fade away. But we have covered this kind of preparation essentially all through 2017. I did it on my morning show and we did it right here on New World Next Week. And we sort of explained they were trialing a lot of this. Of course, they opened it up for their kind of open comment periods. But this is, again, this is the U.S. like commerce departments, again, all of the alphabet agencies. There's something called V2V, which is vehicle to vehicle. That's when your cars talk to other cars. What it sounds like they're already rolling out in New York City is V2X. That would be vehicle to everything. That's why I call it the, the internet of cars. So, James, there's a few other things to kind of uh, shake out here. I can throw it back to you, or I can talk about, of course, all the death caused by uh, auto cars. We'll get to that in a minute. But I think, um, first of all, yes, V2X, the Internet of Cars, is the next step. The next next step, I suppose, in the setting up of the infrastructure that will be needed for the driverless future, which is coming. And again, I talked about this not too long ago, and you did express incredulity at the time. I'm, we're just going to save up all these New World Next Week clips, and at some point in the near future, I'll put them all together and say, really? <laughs> well, you seemed a bit of a doubter before. But anyway, it is coming, and they are putting the infrastructure into place, which will enable this technology. And there is obviously going to be a huge... Uh, rollout and push for this from every angle and sector of society, and they're going to try to engineer society into accepting this technology. But I don't want to absolve 
us of our responsibility in this type of technological change that is happening. Because for the time being, at the very least, there is no gun to your head. And you do not have to participate in these technologies. You do not have to partake in them yet. And there may come a time when it will be basically impossible to function without them. And unless you want to starve in the street as a, you know, whatever. But, but for the time being, we still have a part to play in this. And our voices still matter. And more, perhaps more importantly, what we choose to buy or not buy, what we choose to do or not do, still makes a difference and can shape the, the outcome of what's coming. And I know the people in the crowd are just going to, oh, no, that's stupid. Oh, no, James, it's all, you know, you can't do anything. Well, I, do, I refuse to accept that. And I think we can, we, we have to take more of this into our own conscious control and let me just say, as a, as a personal anecdote, as people know, I stepped away from tw Twitter six months ago, or whatever it was, eight months ago. Um, and honestly, it was an incredibly good decision for me to make. I have more of my own mind time now, to, and I don't have the, the constant feed of venom and hatred invading my consciousness, which it does. It inevitably does when you start plugging yourself into that and into this and into that. And Twitter's just one example of that. I'm sure everyone has a hundred different examples of various ways technology is starting to encroach on our consciousness, on our soul, on who we are as people. And we can step away. It may seem radical. And I know a lot of people did say, why are you going away from Twitter, James? No, it was not a radical step. It was just me taking back my own consciousness. And I've done that to some extent. And it was very liberating. And I am also committing, I have a smartphone slave device in my pocket these days, but I have already committed once that's gone and done, my next phone's going to be a flip phone. Goodbye, smartphone. I'm getting rid of these technological intrusions on my mind in the same way we can do that in the larger sense of what we choose to do with driverless car technology or whatever it is. We will either buy into this literally or we will step away from it. And we still have that opportunity. And I'm going to utilize that while we can. Well, and that's that's where the real that's where the real voting actually happens when we vote with our whatever kind of currencies you'd like to use. So the related that we did have in this, James, Waymo robot car injures motorcyclists, but human driver at fault. I had a story earlier this week about the new consent based sex bot brothel that they're going to open already laying out the scenario like we've seen in idiocracy don't you dare think that you're going to kick the carl's jr machine and not get sprayed in the face with some gas by the new technocracy james any last words on that before we start to wrap this baby up <laughs> i don't think i can add anything to that Okay. We actually, uh, we talked about, of course, the driverless highways and the V2V, V2X just over one year ago on the New World Next Week episode, Techsperts Propose Driverless Highway. And this is the part where we wrap this episode up and mention a little bit of good news. My latest episode of Good News Next Week is up on my Patreon account for Media Monarchy members only, making water out of thin air. It goes to Media Monarchy members first for the first week, and then I, of course, unlock it and let it go to everybody. I've got folks like Richard Grove from Tragedy and Hope, Ryan from The Last American Vagabond, hanging out in the Media Monarchy community, and I would love to see folks join us at MediaMonarchy.com slash join. As I like to say, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. James. All right, awesome. And once again, as deprogramming note, thank you to everyone who's hanging in there for the Big Corbett Report project. It is, uh, you will see something in the next few days. So just uh, hang on to your hats and uh, it'll start coming. Uh, on that note, we're going to do this again next week. James, thanks for your time. All right, buddy. Take care. <laughs>